Your Serene Highness, distinguished guest, all protocol observed. My name is Sylvie Goyer. I'll be the MC for the event. I work for the Prince Albert II of Monaco Foundation, and I'm pleased to, to welcome you here. The event is being organized by the Prince Albert II of Monaco Foundation, the um, Oceanographic Institute, Prince Albert I of Monaco Foundation, and Oceano Zul Foundation, in partnership, our great partners in, in ocean affairs, with uh, SCAR, I ask the European Polar Board and ICCI. I see the representatives here and I'd wish to acknowledge. Thanks for being here. Um, the, um, the event that we have today has been endorsed as a UN Ocean Conference event. Therefore, it is, uh, it's confirms how important polar regions and polar issues are to SDG 14. Yet, you may have seen, for those of you uh, interested in polar issues, there are very few events on polar issues on that conference. This is the first, this is the only physical event on polar issues, recognizing that European Polar Board organized a virtual event yesterday, and there's a couple more of virtual events, but this is the only physical event. And I took the liberty to mention that to um, uh, Special Envoy Peter Thompson, uh, pointing out how come um, the polar oceans are getting so little attention is in SDG 14. That's what we're trying to do here, to demonstrate how the Arctic Ocean and the Southern Oceans are really the engine of the global ocean and how they should be considered and taken into consideration. Over the next hour, we'll first hear from leading scientists about the facts and figures. We'll have graphs. Scientists love graphs and figures and all kind of, uh, uh, all kind of uh, uh, graphs and, 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 and facts like this. Then we'll hear from the messengers. People will carry the message. People will pick up on this information and try to advocate, to show, to demonstrate. And we'll hear from them how they do that why and, and, and how they could do better and how can, they can help scientists share the messages. Finally, let me highlight and let me quote. At the Polar Symposium in Monaco in February 2022, um, then President Larry Hinsman from IASC told us, we scientists, we have a message, we have an understanding, but we don't have necessarily a voice. We're not getting the message across. And that's why we need, and at that time, Your Serene Highness, he was looking at you, but looking at, at all of you as well. That's why we need advocates, and that's why we need you. That's to set the, the tone of this event. But before we go further and we dive into, uh, into the sessions, it's my great pleasure to introduce Mr. Jose Suarez dos Santos, founder and chairman of Oceano Zul Foundation, to welcome you all to this great place here, the Oceanario. Jose, please, you have the floor. Uh, Your Serene Highness, uh, distinguished uh, guests, um, welcome to Oceanario of Lisbon and to Oceana Azul Foundation. You are our first partner, and we are very grateful uh, for that. The first uh, understanding we had when we were about to be born in 2015 was with your foundation. And we carry that very close to our hearts. We, do, we cannot... Um, forget that if we have the MPA of Salvagens, we actually own it to you. Because if it wasn't for your initial impulse with the President of the Republic of Portugal, we would not have been able to do our, our job. It is now the biggest marine protected area in Europe in the Atlantic, which doesn't say much for Europe, because it's not that big. 
and we should do a little bit more. Your actions. Yes, Silvia. Sylvia Earl. Your Serene Highness, you have always been a pioneer. And it's uh, very important that we have amongst us people that can raise the issues and have the capacity to give it a voice and to bring it up in the whole of the discussions that we are having at this moment. We are here today as a result of your innovation. And it's very important, your Serene Highness work that you are doing in this world. So I think the only meaningful thing I can say is you can always count on Oceana Azul Foundation to support our work and to continue with you. And we hope we will continue to deserve your trust. So thank you very much for coming to Lisbon. Thank you very much to visit us at Oceana Azul. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jose. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jose, and uh, thanks for the great welcome to Sylvia, uh, who joined us just now. Thanks for being with us, Sylvia. The one you're waiting for. He's the only head of state to have been to both poles. I don't know how many people here have been to both poles. But he's definitely the champion. He's been championing um, the polar issues and actually just came back from the Arctic tirelessly reminding us how important it is to care for the polar regions. It's my great pleasure, Your Serene Highness, to welcome you to give us a few introductory, re introductory remarks. Gee, that's a tough word, huh? Yes, Monseigneur, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Your Excellencies, your deepness. Uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, Mr. Chairman, I'm delighted to be here in Lisbon, delighted to be here at the, Ocean, the Oceanarium, and delighted to be uh, hosted by our great friends from, uh, from the Ocean Azul Foundation. And thank you very much for, for your kind words, sir. And I'm delighted to see all of you in person today at this event for these discussions. And I'm delighted to talk about uh, uh, the polar regions. And I'm delighted uh, be also because I can give you fresh news from uh, not too far from the North Pole, from, the, from Svalbard. And from, uh, well, we did go all the way up with uh, a beautiful ship called, called the Commandant Charcot, uh, uh, the Ponant Company, all the way up to the ice cap. And, uh, but it's... It is receding, and it's not in great shape, and it's not very thick, but uh, at least it's still there. And so, um, but uh, that's why we need to uh, take care of, of both polar regions. But so the poles are indeed a key component of the ocean system. I think that their role will be examined here in detail, both in, re both in regards to the ocean balance and the balance of different species, currents, and major planetary flows as well as all matters pertaining to the climate. For, for my part, I'd like to highlight the, the event, the, the extent, I'm sorry, to which this role is also of a political nature. And so far as the majority of the challenges we face when implementing actions for the ocean are concentrated in the poles, similar to the concentration in a laboratory. Firstly, concentration of the problems we encounter can be found here, we are all aware of these issues and these problems. There is a difficulty of engaging global action uh, to fight climate change, which we know represents the main threat hanging over these areas. Then there is the multiplication of environmental hazards, as in all marine regions, but at varying degrees, the poles face numerous threats, the accumulation of which has, of course, a multiplier effect. 
There is also a mounting greed among certain private interests growing rapidly around the poles as, as of course, climate change, global warming, and technological progress make access easier. Finally, there is the political complexity, even greater in the polar regions than anywhere else, which has been further exacerbated by current international tensions. This is an illustration of the difficulties we face every time we want to drive forward multilateral solutions for the ocean, especially on the high seas. The laboratory represented by the poles thus offers a genuine concentration of the difficulties encountered. However, it also offers prospects for solutions through various lines of action which we know are effective. First of all, concerted scientific work is re absolutely required and is paramount if we are to achieve that, as we are able to encourage in Monaco. I'm thinking of the work conducted by the Monaco Scientific Center and the work that my foundation is able to support with various international institutions. I'm thinking of the need to develop exchanges between various expertise and various approaches. That is why on my foundation's initiative, we have decided to unite experts on the Arctic and the Antarctic in Monaco every two years, as we did this year, which was surprisingly and astonishingly the first of its kind. Another aspect in, in this laboratory represented by the polls is the awareness campaigns we uh, need to conduct among the general public as well as political and economic players and for which the Oceanographic Institute provides an invaluable tool. And finally, there are concrete conservation activities on the ground in the polar regions which also play a key role in our ambition to protect the ocean. I'm thinking of marine protected areas, of course, such the, as the one created a, a few years ago in the Ross Sea, in which I was happily, uh, ha happy to be involved. Uh, we need to continue these efforts, especially in the Arctic and in uh, three priority areas of the Antarctic, the Antarctic Peninsula, the Weddell Sea, and Eastern Antarctica. These marine protected areas included in international waters, should inspire our wider program of work for the ocean, and that is why the poles, whose physical and biological role is so important, as we all know, for the entire ocean system, will also play a central role from a political point of view, and I hope it will be a successful one. So with these words, I leave you to uh, the rest of the program. Thank you very much for your attention. Monseigneur, thank you very much. Thank you um, for your commitment, for the commitment of the Foundation. You've mentioned the Polo Initiative, an initiative just launched by the Monaco uh, Foundation, the Monaco Institutes, um, together with the Oceanographic Institute uh, and, and others, other partners. Um, we, we salute as well um, the, all the initiatives, and, and you refer to a second sim symposium, which will take place every two years. So we do welcome um, this opportunity for scientists to work and collaborate. Now, without further ado, uh, let's dive into the first session, indeed. Let's bring uh, on board the scientist. It's my pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. Renuka Bade. Renuka, <laughs> the executive um, director of the European Polo Board and the co-founder of Women for Polo, Polo, Polo Science. Yeah? Women for Polo Science. Remarkable. Thank you for your commitment, Renuka. Call on stage. I'll call on stage as well. Um, Professor Mike Meredith, ocean and science leader at the British Antarctic Survey. Mike. <laughs> Dr. Sharon Henle, reader in marine science at the University of Edinburgh. Dr. Florence Coleoni, please, glaciologist and paleo climatologist, oh my gosh, at the National Institute of Oceanography and Applied Geophysics in Trieste, Italy. And Professor, Professor Richard Bellaby, Richard, where are you? Yes, great. 
Chief Scientist for Climate and Ocean at the Norwegian Institute for Water Research, Bergen, Norway, and Director of the SKLEC NIVA Center for Marine and Coastal Climate Research in Shanghai, among many other things. Um, thanks for joining us on stage. Renuka, you have the floor. Brilliant. Uh, thank you very much. And it's my absolute pleasure to welcome the first speaker, Mike Meredith. He studies the global ocean circulations and tries to understand how the polar regions affect the rest of the planet. Mike, please. Thank you very much, Renuka, and it's a, it's a great pleasure to be here um, at this wonderful event. Um, I thought I would start by showing you what is my favorite map. Uh, it's quite an old map, but it recently became um, popular again. The reason I like this map is it presents what I think of as being the fish's idea of what the world looks like. If you asked a fish to draw a map and it could understand you, this is what it is likely to draw. So it's not the continents surrounded by water, like us humans would draw, but it's the oceans surrounded by land. And to me, it, it really does um, convey the message that there is only one ocean, and that ocean provides connectivity across the whole planet. In terms of how and why that connectivity is provided and why it matters, a very useful thing to do is to overlay a schematic of the global ocean circulation. And you can see straight away how critical the polar regions are to that. The Southern Ocean around Antarctica sits squarely in the middle of the global ocean circulation. It really is the crossroads. It's the unifying factor that joins up the other ocean basins. There's also a key place where waters are transformed between shallow layers and deep layers. And that's absolutely critical in governing the ocean's role in climate change. At the other end, there's the Arctic. It seems much smaller on this projection, but again, you can see it's a, it's a key region where waters are transformed from shallow waters into deep waters. And by doing that, it sets the structure of the circulation along the length of the Atlantic. So this circulation, and especially the parts where waters are transformed from shallow to deep and back again, is absolutely critical but it, because it draws down a huge amount of heat from the atmosphere and a huge amount of carbon from the atmosphere, including the carbon that we humans put there through our activities. And through doing that, the ocean does us a huge favor um, by moderating the rate of climate change. But that favor comes at a huge cost, and the cost being ocean warming and ocean acidification, which we'll hear more about from Richard in a moment. Key things to note are that this circulation isn't stable. We know it's changing, we know it's gonna change further into the future, but we have very limited ability to say how it's gonna change into the future. And better understanding in the polar regions is absolutely critical to progress that understanding uh, and uh, enable us to make better projections of how the polar regions and globally the climate will change and how everyone on the planet is affected. So that's the message I'd like to give today and at that point I'll stop and pass back to you, Riluk. Thank you very much for that succinct message. Shan, you're next. Uh, Shan works with animals in the polar regions and how they are living there and why they are living there. Thank Shan. you, Anuka, and good evening. Now, the first point I really want to emphasize is that the UN Ocean Decade and the Arctic and Southern Ocean plans for it are for sustainable development. The polar regions are critical in facilitating and underpinning sustainable development worldwide and achieving SDG 14. Now, there are many similarities between the two polar regions, but also some important differences, both in the ways in which they function and the role that they play in the Earth system, but also in the way that humans interact with them and the influence that they have on global society. So the action plans cater for these similarities and the differences. Now, both plans were developed using an inclusive approach involving a diverse set of stakeholders, including the scientific community, non-governmental organizations, policymakers, the private sector, and residents. And both plans were developed around the seven societal outcomes for the UN Ocean Decade, listed here, and both present a list of high-level challenges and specific objectives to be addressed in order to achieve the overarching um, objective of the UN Ocean Decade, 
which is to deliver the science we need for the ocean that we want. And both action plans also identified a set of cross-cutting themes or barriers to be overcome. These were uh, the connectivity amongst stakeholders and communities, better connectivity between science and management, the need for more and better um, connected data, observations and modeling, of course, the need for more funding, but the importance of capacity building, inclusion and diversity. And overcoming these challenges will be critical as we move from action plans to real action throughout and far beyond the UN Ocean Decade. Back to you. That was very nice. Thank you very much. <laughs> Our next uh, short intervention is from Florence. Um, and this is the best introduction I could come up with. Florence studies the past to understand the present and predict the future. Over to you, Florence. Thank you, Renuka. So, of course, ancients are um, very important in the, in the polar areas um, because of the reflectivity they brought to the, to the system, um, but also because they definitely contribute to uh, regulate the mass exchange between the ocean and uh, the continent. As such, ice sheet melting uh, is contributing to sea level rise, and uh, we all know that now for decades. And uh, why we were starting to discuss about how mitigating our emissions, sea level has been rising. So right now, at both poles, uh, the, the ice sheet are uh, largely contributing to sea level change, and uh, also mountain glaciers, uh, which are at the moment the main contributors to sea level rise. But uh, we, we all know that uh, soon they will disappear, unfortunately, um, and so will remain the ice sheet that will still uh, melt in the future. So what is important to understand for, for the future? So the ice sheet absorbs the heat on a very long time scale. So it's not about what's going on right now on a few years to a few decades. So projection that stop at the end of the 21st century doesn't tell the entire story. Um, because the ice sheet melts very, very slowly, we have to look after the end of the 21st century, and we have to look for several centuries in the future. And if we want to distinguish uh, the impact of our um, um, environmental policies uh, between the most optimistic scenarios following the Paris Agreement, for example, and the most pessimistic one that we are currently following, unfortunately, we need to look um, very much into the future. And there you see the, the huge difference between the scenarios. And this is our commitment to sea level that we have to discuss right now. Will we follow the blue path or the orange path? Okay, so that's, that's where we are right now. Right now, as a scientist, we need more observations. We need more implications. We need more fundings because most of the physical processes that uh, allow the models to um, tie more specific projections in the future are still to be understood completely. And unfortunately, those processes happen in areas that are very challenging even for observation to occur. Most of these uncertainties are, is linked with Antarctica unstable behavior. And uh, in the future, I mean, uh, we, we, we definitely need to um, uh, be sure which pathway the Antarctica will follow in response to the future climate change. And I can tell you that the orange scenario that holds the huge uncertainty uh, that you can see on this graph of multimeter sea level rise is not uh, a science fiction scenario. Because as a paleoclimatologist, I know from geological records and ice core records that this happened in the past for sure. We see that all around Antarctica. So what you see right now, it's not about, OK, that's a pessimistic scenario. I don't want to, to hear about that. No, no, this is a real one. I can tell you from the geological archive that this happened. So this will likely happen if we do not take actions right now. Thank you very much, Florence, for that. Our next speaker is Richard Bellaby, and he studies acidification in the oceans and how that affects the creatures that live within it. Richard. Thank you. We should not take, use the complexity of the chemistry of the carbonate system, carbon dioxide in seawater, to ignore the simple message that the oceans are acidifying, pH is dropping, 
very rapidly. Uh, it's already at levels not seen for two to three million years. And if we carry on with the worst case scenario um, used in the IPCC, we'll have to go back 55 million years before we have seen the same situation in the ocean. The poles are more sensitive than any other ocean. Well, the, the polar oceans are more sensitive. I know there's only one ocean. The polar <laughs> oceans are more sensitive than other oceans. One, because they are receiving carbon from outside. As the, as the waters move uh, polewards, they cool. They take up CO2 from the atmosphere. So, so they're charged with carbon when they arrive there. But then, because of the receding ice cover, there is more um, availability for continued equilibration between the increasing atmosphere and the surface ocean. And in the Arctic, especially, or especially in the East Siberian Shelf at the moment, there is so much more organic carbon going into the waters because of uh, changes in precipitation and changing permafrost regions that this is also the, the respiration or the bacterial breakdown of this organic carbon is adding to this already global anthropogenic acidification that we are seeing. So that's the theory. Uh, the top right is an example of the Eurasian Arctic, so between Svalbard and the North Pole, where <laughs> you just returned from. Um, and here we see, um, we can't go into too, too, too much detail, but you can see there is a progressive change in the color in the subsurface, and that progressive darkening is acidification. And this is only over a 10 to 15 times scale. Um, in the bottom left, you'll also see examples of, of, of what I've said there. What we have only previously seen when we have done experiments exposing plants and, or, and, and animals to high CO2 world, this was actually observations in Canadian waters, where the pteropods are already starting to dissolve. And this is our, it stopped moving now, unfortunately, but this is, this is our charismatic animal. We, in, the, in the ice, you have the... In the, uh, for the ice, you have the polar bear. In the water, we have the pteropod. And this is really uh, under, underpins a lot of the ecosystem that, 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 that is found in, in the Arctic. And a very quick last message as well. Unlike sea ice and unlike surface temperature, which can recover if we act quickly, the ice will return if we modify atmospheric CO2 the signal of pH will continue for 10 to 70,000 years. So those changes that we make now, we cannot change again. It has to react with the sediments. It has to dissolve the calcium carbonate, the reefs, to return back to normal. So, yeah. Thank you very much. I think this was a really good good kind of summarization of why the polar oceans are extremely important for the global ecosystem and the global system. You know, we have a large number of different stakeholders sitting here with us today. I wonder what your thoughts are on, on kind of what different stakeholders we should involve in the process as scientists to spread the message better. For example, what would be uh, the role of private companies or politicians or how do we involve them and what kind of stakeholders do you think are important to involve in the process? Maybe Shan can start with that. Thanks, Ranuka. Yeah, a really important question. Um, it's my belief that everybody needs to be around the table. Um, you can't introduce fisheries legislation if you don't have the fishing organizations, companies, individual fishers represented around the table. Um, there's also substantial benefit to be derived from direct investment from private companies in marine conservation. We have good evidence of this from different places around the world. And I think only by having a, a multifaceted, really inclusive, um, multi-stakeholder approach can we really satisfy ourselves at all that we're coming up with solutions that work for everybody? Because if we exclude people from the conversation, how can their needs be met? This is particularly the case in the Arctic with reference to indigenous communities who actually have the best knowledge and the best skills to conserve their natural environment as they have been doing for thousands of years. 
So by bringing all different types of knowledge to the table, we is the only way that we will be able to really achieve an outcome that works for everybody. Cool. Thank you very much. Um, a lot of you have worked with policymakers before. What is the importance of having policymakers on the table? And maybe Mike can give a quick intervention on that. Um, I think <clears throat> the, the policy relevant aspects of the polar regions are, are enormous. And from all of the speakers here, we've seen how critical it is that the polar regions, polar science, understanding of the polar regions are properly represented in the dialogue in relation to policy. Mm. There's a lot of good work going on, um, especially things like the IPCC. And recently there was a, a special report on ocean and cryosphere um, that your Serene Highness and, and others were instrumental in, in creating. And I think that did a huge amount of good, but we need to build on that now. And things like this UN Ocean Conference here, absolutely critical for sustaining the message and keeping up the pressure on the policy makers that um, to truly solve the issues that humanity are facing in relation to climate change and loss of biodiversity and sea level rise, you need to understand all of the ocean. And the polar oceans, as we've seen, are absolutely critical in the controls that they play um, and the influence they have over the global ocean. So now isn't the time to sit on our laurels. Now is the time to really press ahead with policy relevant actions, um, especially as to regards the Arctic and the Southern Ocean, um, which are still under measured and under understood in relation to the other oceans. Um, and yet they are still you know, two of the most important regions of our planet. Brilliant, thank you. I think I'd like to ask Florence and Richard the same question. You know, what would be the one strong message we would like to pass on to the UN Ocean Conference delegations? from here. Yeah, so <clears throat> silver is rising right now and uh, it will continue to rise. So that's unavoidable. So <laughs> I mean, that's the main important fact, uh, actually. So we are not now trying to discuss how to uh, avoid silver rise because we can't, but we are trying to understand how to mitigate silver rise. And that's very different, unfortunately. So it's a half optimistic and half pessimistic message. On, on another aspect, uh, I would say that for policymakers, what is really important to understand is that, um, unfortunately, half meter sea level rise is something that is very, very likely to happen by the end of the 21st century. So if we really want to um, protect economy, coastline resources, and uh, everything that we have been building in uh, many countries that are uh, really uh, on the oceans, we, we definitely need to uh, think more um, with a larger ambition in uh, our mitigation. So we need to really uh, think about multimeter sea level rise as a target for investments and both in research and in infrastructures for the future and uh, the, the so socio-economical activities. Thank you. Richard? I'll echo the call to mitigate and, and adapt. The adaptation is going ahead already with Arctic communities in uh, uh, looking into new fisheries, looking into new um, uh, sources of food, unfortunately, because it's happening so quickly. And what was actually considered by many scientists as Frankenstein, the geoengineering opportunities or realities now of ocean alkalinity enhancement, of carbon capture and storage, um, and actually the promoting new ecosystems is actually happening now and is happening at a very high level. I mean, especially after the Monaco Ocean Week, the amount of uh, sea forests or the kelp approach to actually certainly uh, approaching challenges through acidification on a seasonal level and actually protecting the ecosystems through promoting certain um, ecotypes, certain ecosystems like kelp. I think without the very large governmental changes, then we have to start acting locally uh, with communities on biological and ecosystem approaches and also base and wide on some of the geoengineering uh, opportunities that are at hand. Thank you very much. And I think we have provided you with a lot of thought for the next session and also going forward with this 
conference. So thank you all the speakers. Thank you for sticking to your time. And thank we'll you. make way for the next slot. Thank you. Please give a, a round of applause again to the speakers. Thanks a lot for the insights, for being as concise as possible. Thank you, Renuka, for the great uh, moderation. Um, just reminding, uh, Mike mentioned sustaining the message to press ahead on policies. I mean, this is, this is critical, and it's a great introduction and linkage to the second session about those messages and messengers. It's my great pleasure to welcome uh, Mr. Ashok Adiseam. Where is Ashok? Ashok is here. Great. Oh, you, you, Ashok, welcome. You're going to be moderating. Um, I see, Richard, I see your tetrapod is not, uh, is not moving anymore. Huh? Is there something wrong? Huh? Acidification is really upon you. Huh? Um, Thank you for that. You see what I meant by graphs and figures. Huh? That's what, when you call upon scientists to come on stage, that's what you get. Hopefully, we're going to get something articulate. Ashok Adiseum is advisor to uh, the ambassador of Paul and Maritime Affairs of the Government of France. Ashok, it's my great pleasure to invite you, and thanks for accepting to moderate uh, that second panel. Um, I'd like to welcome on stage as well uh, Mr. Luke, Sch um, Luke, wait a second, you, you're, you're last. Um, Mr. Robert Calcagno, please, um, Chief Executive Officer of the Oceanographic Institute of Monaco. Welcoming um, architect Julia Foscari, uh, also co-founder of UNA and NGO Unless. Julia, please come on board. My great uh, friend, Mr. Tiago Pita Ecunia, uh, Chief Executive Officer of Oceano Azul Foundation. Tiago, thank you. And the one and only um, renowned filmmaker and naturalist, Luc Jacquet. Luc, please. Ashok, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Sylvie, Monseigneur. Mesdames, Messieurs, je parle un peu en français. Ce sont les deux langues officielles de, de l'ONU. And a bit in English as well to facilitate, just to facilitate this discussion. It's very humbling to be with so eminent builders and creators, uh, Luc, uh, with all your inspirations and all what you have been sharing through your institutions. Uh, the Institut Oceanographique de Monaco et la Maison de l'Océan. Uh, I guess that everybody knows uh, l'Institut Oceanographique uh, de, de Monaco, but, but I think in this particular context of the uh, UN Ocean Conference, it would be great to see how it connects and your, your commitments, uh, how it's connected to this UN Ocean Conference. The same thing here, Thiago, uh, uh, receiving us and so many events of the UN Conference. Actually, the UN Conference is here. Uh, happening here, Monseigneur, uh, with your uh, presence. Uh, thank you for all your commitments as well. And we would like to know uh, from you, how do you engage not only with this conference, but your European commitments, and how you have transformed the Oceanarium into a place for knowledge, for knowledge production and for commitment. Uh, uh, Luke, this time not last, and, 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 and never the least, uh, your own creations that everybody knows uh, and which have won the Oscar uh, for uh, the Great March of the Penguins, uh, La Grande Marche, and all what you have been doing and inspiring uh, all of us, like, like uh, the ambassador who also has promoted and worked with your disciples, I would say, Laurent Ballesta and Vincent Munier, last year with our festival L'Été Polaire. Uh, we would like to to benefit uh, this evening from your transmissions and from your values, and especially in our finishing with Julia, uh, through your emotions. I think there's, there's no ocean without emotion, and, and that's what carries us, and that's what uh, we are committed, uh, Monseigneur, in your latest book. Uh, that's what you are transmitting also uh, to us, and thank you all for the inspiration and the commitments. So uh, it's difficult to be a passeur of passeurs. Uh, C'est vous les passeurs. And uh, so I, I think without, uh, without more uh, comments, uh, we could start if, uh, this order, if you, you agree, uh, Robert. 
uh, with uh, the Institut Oceanographique. Uh, c'est quoi, c'est pourquoi, c'est pour qui uh, l'Institut Oceanographique de Monaco et la Maison, uh, Maison de l'Océan, which is now also, you, you have rebranded, if I may say, uh, uh, calling it the Oceano. So maybe uh, t uh, from the Oceano, uh, what is your, what is your uh, stake on, on, on today, uh, the Institut Oceanographique's activities, uh, and maybe we'll, we, we'll finish also with, uh, with you on your, your polar exhibitions. Uh, Robert, uh, c'est à vous. Um, thank you very much, Ashok. It's a real pleasure to be with you this afternoon and to speak about and to act uh, regarding polar worlds. Uh, the Oceanographic Institute Foundation, Prince Albert I of, uh, of Monaco, uh, was created in 1906, but uh, uh, the involvement of the Principality of Monaco is even older. Uh, I think even when Prince Albert I, your great, great grandfather, Monseigneur, uh, was young, he was already dreaming of exploring this, uh, this polar world and actually was able to organize and to conduct uh, four uh, different uh, oceanographic uh, expeditions in Svalbard. So you have here uh, the map and a few pictures. Uh, we were there just a few days, uh, we just landed, in fact, a couple of hours ago, and we were there yeah, this morning. And uh, yeah, I could, we, could, we could have had a third picture, because yesterday afternoon, Monseigneur, you were exactly at the same position uh, regarding and observing the Liliu Glacier. And unfortunately, uh, you told me that the difference between 1906 and 2005 was already great. But between 2005 and, and, uh, and now, uh, the glacier resides by more than half a kilometer. Yeah. That's exactly what you told me. So uh, we were there, and unfortunately, uh, we can uh, testify that uh, climate change is, is now, and uh, it's working. And the, the interior... The Which interior is dramatic which is dramatic, of course. And uh, the interesting point, and regarding which your question about what is Oceano, it's, in fact, we were not alone. Monseigneur, Bernard Fautrier, Olivier Venden, Cyril Gomez, and myself, uh, we were with uh, 140 business leaders uh, in a, participating in a, to a commemorative, commemorative trip for the commemoration of the 100th anniversary of the passing away of Prince Albert I. But clearly, the purpose of that trip was to bring this business leader to see with their own eyes what are the change. It's something to read a book. And you can find uh, uh, the book the Oceanographic Institute produced in your, in your talk back. It's something to see a movie. Thank you very much, Luc. But it's completely different to see using your own eyes. And uh, we uh, have already exchanged with them. They are going to change. They are going to act. They are going to take decisions right from now in their own business. So that's important. I mentioned Prince Albert I, but I should have also mentioned Commandant Jacques-Yves Cousteau. He was uh, the director of the Oceanographic Museum. And exactly 50 years ago, he started with the Calypso expedition in Antarctica. And after that first expedition, he, he continued the fact. And for example, uh, in the 90s, he, he triggered a petition which covered more than 1.2 million signatories. That was before internet. So can you imagine that? And this, uh, this petition was to protect Antarctica against exploitation. And using that 1.2 million signatories, he was able to convince the US government, the French government, the Australian government. And this led to the Madrid Protocol. And a strong protection of the Antarctic continent. You have just demonstrated, uh, Robert, uh, that uh, your activities as a scientist, as a museum uh, director general, as an institute, uh, and as an explorator uh, that, you, that you are, I, I know that you have these fantastic activities of exploration, which are very traditional in, in, and, and pioneer in, in, in Monaco, how they impact the global uh, situation, the global commitments, the global, global alert, and also activities. Can you tell us more about your reaching out in terms of audience, audiences, and your, your partnerships 
uh, without going into secrets, but, but uh, you have this global uh, outreach, which is very similar to uh, Oceano Azul, and we're very humbled to, to, to be in, in, in both your hands. Uh, when we, in France, with the ambassador, we were wondering that, that there's no such institutions. Uh, they are uh, scattered. We have great scientists, we have great explorers, we have great specialists of poles uh, and, and, and creators who have created, but we don't have institutions like yours. Uh, what is your, your, your secret and your, uh, your outreach uh, today? Oh, we work very closely with Oceano Azul and we are a very strong partner. Uh, the Oceanographic Museum has the chance to be able to work with 650,000 visitors per year and is much bigger, more than one, one million. One million. <laughs> Congratulations, Thiago. But I think to give one idea only, uh, a key word is interactivity. Now you need to to engage your, your visitors. You cannot just teach them some things. And for example, we just opened that new Polar Mission exhibition. Thank you. Can you and say a few words? Yes. Yes. And the key for that, of course, we speak about uh, exploration. We have an immersing, immersing room. We can uh, explain the, the biology of, uh, of the Arctic works. But the key word is interactivity. And we invite, in fact, our visitors uh, to become a kind of committed reporter. So when they arrive, they receive a carte de presse, a press card, and they can interact with uh, experts, they can ask questions, they can uh, read their answer, and eventually at the end of the visit, we ask them to testify and to express their own opinion. So we try to do what Prince Albert I and Commandant Cousteau have done more than 150 years ago. And after that, today, uh, the, the Polar Mission exhibition was open 15 days ago. So we are now working with uh, our visitors to understand on which subject they would like to, to commit and to engage. For example, we are proposing them, what do you think about marine protected area in the uh, uh, Austral uh, Ocean? And we see if they are ready to, to commit, and as Commandant Cousteau has done 50 years ago, if they want to push the business leader, and maybe more importantly, the corporate leaders to change, to decide, and to act. Fantastic. We'll stay on that word change and the experience that you are proposing. I don't know if you want to give a, a, a clap to, to what has just now been said, which is really, really impressive. Uh, as a visitor uh, at your Institut Oceanographique, I have personally, uh, and, uh, with the ambassador, experienced this transformative experience. When you visit your exhibitions and your, your, your venue, the way you are uh, in the space, it's a transformative uh, experience through the ocean. And I think that's the s very similar to what's happening uh, here uh, in uh, the uh, Oceanarium of, of Lisbon and the Oceano Azul Foundation. Without giving too much of your secrets, because that you can share only really with us for, for our next uh, endeavors, but, but uh, how did you transform this, uh, uh, Thiago, the, this Oceanarium, which was already very famous, very, very dedicated to the ocean, of course, into a place which offers this transformative experience, producing knowledge, and again, because we have to stay in this section with the emotions and motions, how do you do that, 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 that mix? Well, thank you very much for the question, Ashok, and uh, your Turin Highness. As José said, we are really honored to have you. I hope that you feel at home. You've been a frequent visitor. I wish you can use the Oceanario as a base for your staying during this uh, week's conference. Um, and also, of course, of all our friends as well, from um, the Institut de and from the uh, Prince Albert II Foundation. Uh, please use uh, the Oceanario and the Foundation as your uh, base. You'll be very most welcome. Um, well, we actually, the Foundation, in a way, inherited Oceanario. And uh, Oceanario was already famous. That's no merit of the Foundation. I think it's a merit of the incredible team that has been here for more than 20 years. And what that gave to uh, the Foundation was that most foundations they, if I use financial language or economic language, they are mostly B2B. They are business to business. And they operate with other foundations. They operate with other stakeholders. And immediately, we had an incredible window, like you have in Monaco, 
to um, citizens. So we have a B2C possibility too. And that's what really made us think that we could not lose, lose that opportunity because we only do oceans, but on oceans we do everything. We do marine protected areas, we do international advocacy, we do uh, a lot of network, we do a lot of school education. And of course, Oceanario has an incredible track record on school education, more than 20 years, is by far the most powerful school ocean literacy center in Portugal, and we needed to take advantage of that too. And then of course, um, uh, the messages that we have here, we are very careful with the messages because the team that has been ruling Oceanario and João Falcato and his team, they deal with uh, Oceanario as if it's a cathedral. And uh, we have very little information inside. Everything is dark so that we humans do not see each other and we only see what's there to see. Uh, we have some messages outside, but very few messages uh, uh, in between us and, uh, and the tanks. Uh, so uh, we think that we probably try to conquer people through the heart more than through the reasoning. The emotions. Uh, the emotions. You open the chakras first. <laughs> <laughs> you may say so. Uh, I think that probably another interesting aspect that I should say as well that the foundation has been trying, we have a very strong communication department because we think that the communication department is not just a department to divulge the programs of the foundation. The communication department is a program on itself for us. It's two in one. And so uh, we, uh, we sometimes are even accused of being a bit aggressive with the way we communicate with uh, the traditional media, but we are very frequently uh, in the media. We think that's a way of reaching out to uh, people and to uh, help changing behaviors. That's why you're on the messenger section. Yeah, <laughs> we are very much, I think, we are very much on, uh, on trying to uh, organize campaigns, on trying to reach to people, and of course, through the help of uh, friends like Enrique Salo, we also use scientific expeditions to pump science uh, and take out communication in areas where we think that it's important, for instance, to uh, build marine protected areas, do conservation on the ground. If I may, how do you measure that? How do you measure the impact? So the impact on the audience you can measure, you measure your, your tickets, you measure the, the number of schools and, and the activities, but how do you measure your impact in terms of uh, policy making or influence. I know that uh, you, in your career you worked in the European Commission, you worked in the cabinet of the president of Portugal, uh, you're totally uh, involved and you're a strategist and, a, and an ocean uh, activist, a, a stakeholder, for uh, a major stakeholder in Europe. For that. How do you, you measure that, that impact uh, of the, the, uh, the foundation here? Well, in our programs, in our educational programs, we have the sheer numbers. In 2019, we reached 275,000 kids with our school programs. Um, but, of course, that's not, that's not the end of it. Um, uh, we also, of course, measure uh, the number of visitors, uh, as Robert uh, referred. Uh, and, we, uh, and when, of course, you communicate through the press, there are very interesting, enigmatic ways of telling you what the audience is and how many people you have reached. And so you do that on digital and on traditional media. Um, what I find, I think probably what I'm going to say that is probably not the most humble thing to say is that I think that because of all this communication in five years, we think that we changed very much the speech about the ocean in Portugal. I think that we change even sometimes the lexic of some words. Natural capital, it's a wording that now is very used. Uh, uh, and these are the kind of um, expressions that by communicating, you manage to, to pass. And so when we started five years ago, the ocean uh, speech was much more on the maritime economy, was the blue growth. It was, uh, and I think that five years now, it's completely on ocean conservation and much more on, we need to invest in natural capital before we can have an economy. So capital first, nature first, and then the economy. And I think that is, uh, is passing. I think, if I may, on, on, on your two institutions at this stage, because we, we can continue the discussion, but uh, you have built an institution uh, with, with very uh, great uh, and noble uh, founders, and you are uh, totally present in your world today. You are connected, you're digital, uh, you are communicated, communicating, and you're really uh, reaching out uh, to, to the audience and transforming us in our commitments uh, from the policymakers to the general to the general audience it's it's like a very uh, 
it's it's much more than than usual museums uh, because you you are in the world you're connected automatically through the oceans uh, and you are building also uh, uh, policy through uh, through your uh, through your activities and 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 influence in um, in, a, in a very specific region which is uh, continental Europe uh, the EU are 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 are, are the, the territory of uh, of Europe and opening and leading I think both your institutions uh, uh, the 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 way for for different institutions to get to get inspired in Europe. I, I would like to mention uh, Oceanopolis uh, in in Brest, which is a fantastic uh, a fantastic institution as well. Luc Jacquet, you came back with so many realizations. Uh, we know most of them because they have crossed us. Uh, what is your opinion today? on the state of the ocean and, and what can we do? Because we are here uh, at the UN Conference for the Ocean. W what is still possible? What do you, what do you still believe in, in common action and in commitment? And as a, uh, as a fantastic uh, realizateur as, and an artist, if you allow me to say so, as a creator, uh, how do you see, I won't say the role, but the, the position of the creators in this uh, ocean community? Easy question. Sorry. No, um, it's okay. We, okay. Now, of course, um, just I was thinking about uh, when we released the March of the Penguins in 2006, there were no social medias. And now, how many medias are we in the world? Each single person is a media by itself now. So for me now, the key question is how to raise awareness uh, with a strong message in the middle of all this background noise, if I would say so. I think there is no single uh, solutions. Of course, there is the museum. Of course, there is the cinema. Of course, there is the TV. And I feel that more and more the scientists need needs bridge between their knowledge, between their research, and the global public. And as we have seen during the virus, it's not very easy to, to, um, to share the science, to share the detail, the, the doubt of the science, because the science is built on doubt, on theory. And our job is more and more difficult for that. You are mentioning uh, Robert, uh, uh, Mr. Cousteau, Jacques Cousteau. When Cousteau went in, ex in, ex in expedition, he was almost alone. And when he, when he released the film, it was a single film. So as a kid, I was absolutely, absolutely mesmerized by the film of Cousteau. How many films do we have now on, on wildlife and stuff? And for me, this is the most uh, difficult thing we have. And also because we need the means, because more and more the medias go for entertainment. So with very s simplified message. And we have to find the means. And to be honest, this is not very easy. Uh, I did five films, I'm making several new films, but uh, to be honest, I'm thinking about the impact. We are talking about the impact. Of course, you cannot uh, see the box office and say, okay, I have uh, 50 millions of people impact. Not really. And for me, the most difficult thing is the follow-up. How I'm able to commit the people getting out from the film, getting out from the museum, and keep them raised. Of course, there is the emotion. We need emotion because scientists, scientists are talking with figures and we need them to produce knowledge. And our job is to make stories, to build stories and to build emotion with this knowledge. But really, this is very difficult. Furthermore, during that time, because people have many things to think except the Antarctic and the polar region. And of course, all of us here are of course absolutely, uh, this is crystal clear, we have to take care of these regions. Um, even for our own respectability, even for our own civilization. Because it's, it's for me, it's a way to be civilized to take care of the earth that we are living on. But um, I think maybe it's going to be the number of us. This is the skill, each skill aggregated all together to move all the society, but really we have to, we have to be very clever.
and scale up probably yep. uh, when we aggregate thanks to to creators and creations that you that that come out from you and aggregate so many millions of people uh, who I'm sure you have transformed their lives and perceptions and, and alarming on, on on what's happening. When is your next uh, trip to to one of the two poles? Oh, uh, thanks to the foundation and for Monaco government. Now we are making a film on Galapagos about evolution. Uh, we are going to start the shooting next spring because for me this is very important to understand as human what is going on all the time. Because as human, we are thinking that we are, uh, we are not, we are out of this process. Of course not, we are not uh, out of this process. And maybe understanding how does it work, how the life is moving, changing all the time, transforming all the time, is something very important. And maybe more important than ever because many people now try to say oh, evol evolution is something but maybe there is something else and for me this is very dangerous we have to go back to the science and be proud of the science we cannot trust in the science <laughs> no, we, we cannot trust in the science to sell to send rockets on people and do not trust on science when it's talking about bad thing or bad message. So this is something, uh, this is something absolutely uh, important for me. Thank you, that's fantastic because it's a real connection with, I think I'm speaking uh, on behalf uh, of, under the control of Peter Thompson, whose spirit is probably with us while he's busy at the UN conference that, and it's, it's one of the thematics, it's science and partnerships, the, the conference in, in Lisbon. And, and to add, uh, I'm now editing a film named uh, Magnetic, Magnetic Continent because uh, this is my 30 years birthday uh, in Antarctica and I'm still uh, trying to understand why I'm so addicted. And many people are addicted, <laughs> Monseigneur, <laughs> to, the, to, the, to the polar region, even Shackleton, even Charco, even many great people think, why are we so addicted? So now I'm making a film, very arty style, black and white, uh, beautiful picture, and it's going to be a road trip from uh, Patagonia to uh, South Pole released in spring uh, next year. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Julia, if uh, we immediately ask you to, to go and to dive in into your, you're an architect, you're a creator, you have been traveling and you're inventing on a scientific basis as an architect, putting in emotions. Uh, can I ask you to briefly share with us your uh, creations and what do you expect uh, from conferences like the, like the one in Lisbon? What are the outcomes you expect before we uh, hand over and, and ask uh, our ambassador uh, for the conclusion to balance the extremes of these uh, this discussions uh, today? Well, thank you very much, Julia. Ashok, and I'd like to also thank the Prince Albert II Foundation for the invitation to be here tonight. Well, I, like Luke and all of us, believe in the power of the arts to catalyze global action. And as an architect, uh, I founded Unless, which is a nonprofit agency for change. And with Unless, we first and foremost invited 150 leading uh, experts on the Antarctic to collaborate on a multidisciplinary and transnational effort to somehow produce a holistic body of research, which actually I'm, I'm holding here. It's a publication in the first place. Um, to somehow, as a tool to disseminate knowledge on the Antarctic, on the Southern Ocean that surrounds it, and on the role that it has in the global ecosystem. So focusing on geopolitics, science, and inhabitation and architecture, which has quite been overlooked on the continent, the Antarctic continent, we had with, uh, with the Antarctic Resolution, the project actually has a twofold ambition. One was to create a high resolution image of the continent, one which could be understood by a wide audience of people, so there was a big effort of translating, as an architect, the message of scientists into graphs, cartographies, drawings, and infographics, which could actually allow the message to be understood, uh, ideally, by, by also a wide audience, um, but also to sort of advocate for Antarctic resolutions and try to sort of create a constituency for the only continent without indigenous populations. Um, as any publication, I think it has the limit of, uh, as an analog tool of accessibility, so we were uh, very, very sort of pleased with the result of the publication in so far that allowed us to then be invited into uh, by cultural institutions to present researches. We just uh, won a European Commission a prize which will allow us to develop the project even further within a European dimension. But obviously there's a limitation of accessibility. So we're trying now to sort of transform this and translate it into an open access archive on Antarctica on again these three realms, so geopolitics, science and architecture. Um, as a tool that can hopefully allow us to sort of keep collaborating in a 
multidisciplinary. As you were saying, we have to all come together so we can perhaps as architects help translate or as, as art, with artists also create the emotion that you are calling for. That's fantastic. <laughs> Thank you very much. So. Can I say that you, you don't bring only the voice of, of the Poles, but also the one voice of Venice here, uh, which is very, uh, also in Lisbon, uh, an inspiration for, for, for all of us as we speak about the, the ocean and the maritime, maritime affairs. I think we are through with this uh, section. We had the exact balance between uh, creators and builders, uh, and we are filled again with, uh, with all what you have been and what you are uh, doing to inspire us. Thank you very much, Sylvie. Thank you very much to, to you, Ashok, and to, to all of the panelists. A round of applause. I know you would love to talk uh, a lot more, and, and it'd be, it's great listening to you. Thank you very much. Um, another round of applause, maybe, to all of them. Huh? What a beautiful panel. Thank you very much. Um, to conclude, for concluding remarks after this uh, great insights into the science and, and the amazing you know, messages uh, that, that you've heard, artists and, and constructors, uh, it's my great pleasure to invite um, His Excellency Ambassador Olivier Poivre d'Arvor to give us a few concluding remarks. Ambassador for the Paul and Maritime Affairs. Ambassador, the floor is yours. Uh, bonsoir à vous, et it's, it's a real pleasure to be here. My embassy is a very small one. In fact, we are two. You start with the moderator, Ashok Adisiam, my deputy, and, and myself. But um, the two of us are, are very uh, concerned by what you were discussing, uh, polar issues. Um, the cold is getting hot. That's your slogan. Excellent one. And... Um, well, thank you to the all speakers who, um, with their explanation, open our eyes, even most of you know the situation. Uh, the situation is critical, in fact. Uh, I'm sorry to, so, to conclude with, uh, with some bad news, but if you add climate change, so everybody agree on that, and everybody will agree on, on the, what we can say, call uh, geopolitical disorder, we are facing a ma major ge geopolitical disorder. When we start to, to write the uh, new polar strategy for France uh, last year, we were quite optimistic. And uh, we were supposed to, to give the uh, strategy to the French president, Mr. Macron, in, in February, just after the One Nation Summit in, in Brest. But, but um, the 25th of February, uh, the war, uh, start and the Arctic uh, map uh, change a lot because you know, as you know, uh, at this time the Arctic Council uh, doesn't work at all. It's under the Russian presidency, so we are going to we have to wait for the next presidency. Will be Norway in May uh, 2023, but we are not sure that uh, the Arctic Council can carry on. And um, it's uh, very disturbing because if you add climate change, just come from Greenland, um, it's so worrying what happens on the inland. Is if you add what happened in uh, with the glaciers in uh, Antarctica, and if you add also um, the net uh, given by um, the Russian Federation and China about the possibility of, uh, of having two new MPA, and you know be better than everybody, uh, His Highness, uh, how it is important, the uh, East Antarctica and the sea, uh, the Weddell Sea. Um, it means that really, uh, we are not in quiet uh, areas with the two uh, poles. So we have scientists, um, policy makers, government, all together, and perhaps to imagine something like uh, one polar summit in the next month to discuss about this extremely fragile world um, we were discussing today. It's the most fragile world, pa pa regions of the planet. 
It's also because the, deg the deg degradation sorry, will impact the whole ocean system, we discussed that, and is connected to the global climate change. But to conclude this discussion on a more uh, optimistic uh, perspective, I would like to, to share a few observations about the poles and the way we, perce we perceive them. Um, the polar regions have always attracted explorers. You know that better than us uh, in your family, uh, Monseigneur. It is maybe more correct to say that the search for the pole has turned a number of ordinary or not people into lifetime explorers. That was the case with the first French sailors and scientists who traveled the Southern Ocean. And we could say the same about some of our fellows still planning further ex expedition to the poles. I think about the Tara expedition, Romain Trouble is probably here, but also to Jean-Louis Etienne with the uh, polar pod in the uh, Southern uh, Ocean. But the beauty of the pole is also embedded in the remoteness, even scientists who spent months in Antarctica for purely scientific purposes come back with a very unique feeling, feelings and impressions that science alone cannot explain everything. Therefore, we should not forget the artistic uh, dimension. And we were happy to hear two of, of you uh, just before of the polar research, whether through literature, cinema, photography, painting, or music, the image of the poles should be more diverse than only a scientific one. The fact is that people in our non-polar countries um, are easily fascinated by those regions far away from them, but that fascination is built upon the information they get. It's our responsibility to give the, the right information. That explains why in the first French national polar strategy, whose name is Balancing the Extreme, Equilibre les Extremes, it was suggested to launch a, a kind of uh, artist residence, a kind of Villa Medicis on ice to enable creators and designers uh, to work in scientific station in sh and ships also in both Arctic and Antarctic regions. For finally, to conclude, let us emphasize that polar oceans are not at all secondary oceans. And the, it's why it's so important to have decided to organize this event, the only, only one on polar issues during this UN conference, thanks to the foundation uh, you have uh, created, uh, Monseigneur, thanks to what you do, uh, Robert. And um, we are all together. Um, it's not easy, climate change and geopo geopolitical disorder, but we, we, I'm sure in, um, in a few years' time, everybody will consider that polar regions are a main concern for the humanity, and I will see the future um, in a quite more positive uh, perspective after what I have heard during this fascinating uh, and, um, and quite motivating uh, session. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador, for the, for the good words and for your uh, commitment. Uh, this uh, concludes the session. Um, let me uh, first uh, hope um, that this session will encourage further scientific collaboration, initiatives, campaigns, and all of this uh, to bring to light how these oceans uh, are critical to the Sustainable Development Goals and to SDG 14 in particular. Um, let me take that opportunity to mention that uh, we, uh, to accompany this event and to build on the symposium in February in Monaco, we are launching a campaign, and you see, um, you see the first screen here. We're launching a campaign, building on the call to action to protect the pole and to give polar regions a voice. Please help us give them a voice. And we're sharing on the social media, we're sharing uh, messages uh, and, uh, and, and videos uh, from today. So please help us do that. And uh, with your help, your Serene Highness, and all of you, um, we hope this uh, campaign will take us further. I'm very humbled and appreciative of all of you being here. We have great scientists here, amazing people, committed people. So really thank you to all of the participants for being here. Thank you to the uh, great speakers. I know you've traveled just for a few minutes 
to be with us. This is amazing. We're extremely grateful to all of you for your commitment and, and for being here. Let me thank um, the team um, who put all this together from Oceano Azul, um, Thiago, Herminia, Sam, they've been wonderful. From the Oceanographic Institute, I'd like to thank Cyril, Pierre, been wonderful again, and from the uh, Prince Albert II of Monaco Foundation. Let me thank uh, Nadej and the whole team up there for everything you've done. Um, that's been terrific. Um, before, before you close, let me just quickly mention two housekeepings. You have a book uh, and a little, uh, a little pin, polo pin in your bag. Please don't forget it here, otherwise we'll... Uh, you know, we'll sell it on the, on the street or something. Um, and then all of you, I'd love to have the speakers on stage for a picture. And those of you, scientists, uh, um, artists, whoever want to join the picture, please come. We'd like to have a nice picture of all of you. And finally, we invite you at the end to kindly uh, follow some of us, host and hostesses. I think we've made sure we had host and hostesses. Uh, we're going to escort you to the cocktail um, area just, just upstairs. Thank you very much. Your Serene Highness, thanks for your presence. And thanks to all of you for your commitment. Thank you.